I'm very glad to be able to uh, join you in this way, although sorry that the change of dates for the conference meant that I could not be with you in person. I think that the issue that's covered in the draft report of the Productivity Commission, and which is the subject of today's conference, uh, is of very large importance for Australia and the international community. Uh, we're discussing these issues uh, at a critical time uh, within Australia. Uh, this is the time when we're just starting to face up to the implications of a deterioration in political culture uh, which has generated what I've described as the great Australian complacency of the early 21st century. Uh, one consequence of the great complacency uh, is that uh, after being right at the top of the OECD League for Productivity Growth in the 1990s, Australia's gone right down to the bottom in the first decade of the 21st century and in the last five years has had no total factor productivity growth at all. And in the international community, uh, and especially in the Western Pacific region that means the most to us, um, a decade of uh, rapid trade um, liberalisation and trade expansion uh, from the mid-80s uh, until the Asian financial crisis uh, has given way to uh, a period of problematic trade uh, and the replacement of strong momentum for unilateral liberalisation uh, and, multi and multilateral liberalisation uh, by um, the growth of preferential trading areas which has seriously disrupted uh, that wholesome pattern of, of uh, regional and global trade expansion. Uh, this is not the first time the world has faced big issues of these kinds. Um, we faced them early in the 20th century, we faced them in the 1930s. Uh, but let's be clear, uh, we're facing uh, historic choices at the moment and the discussion of the draft re report of the Productivity Commission uh, will be part of Australia's choice. Uh, I think it's worthwhile going back into the history and uh, uh, I like to uh, uh, go back to the big debate about preferential trade at the beginning of the 20th century where uh, a British uh, Conservative Party of which uh, Winston Churchill was a member uh, was contemplating movement from um, open free trade uh, to preferential trade and uh, a young and clear-headed and forceful young man called uh, Winston Churchill uh, warned the leader of his party and I'll go back to Jenkins uh, biography of Churchill. Um, Churchill said uh, our planet is not a very big one compared with other celestial bodies and I see no particular reason why we should endeavour to make inside our planet a smaller planet called the British Empire, cut off by impassable space from everything else. And then uh, Churchill wrote to his leader, um, Balfour, uh, I am utterly opposed to anything which will alter the free trade character of this country and I consider such an issue superior in importance to any other now before us. Preferential tariffs even in respect of articles which we are bound to tax for revenue purposes are dangerous and objectionable. But of course it is quite impossible to stop there and I am persuaded that once the policy is begun it must lead to the establishment of a complete protective system involving commercial disaster and the Americanization of English politics. Uh, on that issue uh, Churchill left uh, the uh, uh, the Conservative Party and moved uh, to the Liberals. It was uh, a big issue, big enough for him to make that large choice. Well, for Australia, uh, the tradition uh, established by the, uh, the, the Tariff Board and then the Industries Assistance Commission, the Industries Commission and the Productivity Commission uh, was to have a draft report on important issues. Uh, before coming to a final report and uh, uh, that great tradition of the draft report gives us an opportunity uh, to uh, turn this, this current exercise uh, into uh, a contribution 
uh, to uh, important Australian choices uh, at a time uh, when choices need to be made. Uh, as I see it, uh, the, the draft report before us contains a lot of good thoughts and good ideas, a lot of bad thoughts and bad ideas, and uh, they're jumbled together without much analytic clarity. And the task of the final report is going to be to uh, re-inject re the analytic rigour uh, that has allowed uh, the, the Tariff Board and its successors uh, to play an important role in public policy in Australia uh, over the past 40 years. What matters for productivity growth in Australia and its partners are the, the systemic effects of trade policy. And there's two types of systemic effects that are important. One affects on the domestic policy making system and the other affects on the international trading system. Uh, a simple and unambiguous commitment to free trade uh, served Australia well in its reform era, the time of, that gave rise to the strongest relative productivity growth in our history. Uh, it also allowed us to play a positive role in the international community and to be part of a Western Pacific system uh, of concerted unilateral liberalisation that saw the radical opening up uh, of the economies of uh, virtually all of the countries of the Western Pacific, uh, of our neighbour New Zealand as well as Australia, in Northeast Asia of Japan, Korea, Taiwan, most important of all for the international system, China, of Vietnam, all of the ASEAN countries. And the fact that all of these countries uh, from the mid-80s uh, until 1997 uh, were engaging in a process of concerted unilateral liberalisation meant that each country's unilateral liberalisation benefited each country even more than it would have if each country had operated in isolation. One of the strengths of the draft report is that it acknowledges clearly in several places uh, that most of the gains, the majority of the gains from trade liberalisation come from what we do ourselves and we can get those gains right now uh, from unilateral liberalisation, removing our last trade barriers uh, without international negotiations. And, and that's how we went about our business uh, and how the Western Pacific uh, partners of Australia went about their business uh, in that critically uh, important time of uh, open regionalism uh, that uh, underpins our current prosperity. Uh, it's an error of the draft report to suppose that the benefits of other countries' liberalisation need to be secured through some sort of negotiation, uh, either uh, bilateral or multilateral. Uh, the reality of what happened in the most liberal period uh, of uh, uh, trade in the Western Pacific uh, is that the decisions weren't taken without bilateral negotiations uh, or multilateral negotiations. They took place because each country was persuaded that liberalisation was in its own interests. The draft report properly acknowledges uh, the potentially positive role of transparency arrangements in other countries uh, and does suggest that this could be uh, a good objective of Australian policy to uh, transplant such institutions in other places. I think the draft report undervalues the potential importance uh, of transparency mechanisms. Uh, if the Western Pacific uh, had had them uh, right, right through from uh, China and Korea to Indonesia uh, in the high tide of liberalisation, things would have been even better. But we have to uh, recognise that uh, things went a long way uh, on the basis of uh, the spread of ideas about trade liberalisation serving the national interest even without them. This is the story of open regionalism uh, and I don't think that it's properly represented uh, in the draft report and I hope that the uh, final report can come to grips with the real history. Quite a number of uh, papers and a dis discussion of the history of the idea up to 1996 in my book 
uh, open regionalism and uh, trade liberalization, um, an Asia-Pacific contribution to the world trade system that the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies jointly with Allen and Unwin published uh, back in 96. I won't go over some of the, the basic ground about uh, open trade that's covered there. If we look at the, uh, the history, uh, we can see that uh, uh, in Australia and New Zealand, in China, in manufacturing trade in Japan, Korea and Taiwan, uh, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in all of the other uh, ASEAN countries, uh, there, there was very substantial trade liberalization and trade expansion uh, in the period that that I call the period of open regionalism, the mid-80s to 97. When you go through uh, the experience of each of those countries, there was almost no liberalization as a result of negotiations of any kind, bilateral or multilateral, in that period. There was benefit from the formation of APEC, Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, in 1989, and then the Bogor Declaration uh, of heads of government uh, in Indonesia in 1994, uh, in which uh, members of APEC committed themselves to uh, free and open trade by 2010 for developed countries and 2020 uh, for developing countries. One can trace fairly direct effects of APEC and the Bogor Declaration to uh, an extra uh, set of steps in liberalization in Indonesia around and after Indonesia's hosting of the 1994 APEC meeting, uh, in and after and around uh, President Ramos's uh, hosting of uh, the APEC meeting uh, in the Philippines in 1996, uh, and uh, throughout this period in China's uh, uh, momentum uh, in unilateral liberalization. In each case, um, uh, APEC and the commitments that uh, had been made within APEC uh, added momentum to what was already uh, wholesome uh, unilateral liberalization. Now, one can point to a few points in this period and after in which there was additional uh, liberalization as a result of multilateral negotiations. Uh, the liberalization of agriculture in Korea Taiwan and Japan were significantly been, uh, helped by the uh, Uruguay round. And uh, 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 the commitments that China made on entry into the World Trade Organization, uh, the commitments that China began to implement in 2001 and implemented uh, over the next half dozen years, uh, were substantial. They led to substantial expansion uh, of uh, services trade, uh, manufacturers trade, agricultural trade, uh, after trade liberalization. One can say that in these particular cases, the multilateral negotiations helped. Uh, but the big theme was unilateral liberalization, supported by uh, the knowledge that other countries in the region were adopting a similar pattern. This mattered enormously for Australia. Uh, if you're looking at who matters in international trade, well, other countries matter in proportion to what their trade would be in a world of free trade. And in a world of free trade, the Western Pacific economies from New Zealand uh, up to Korea and uh, northern China uh, would amount to a large majority of Australian trade. By comparison, a potential trade for, with the whole of the Americas is relatively small. Uh, and matters much less. So the phenomenon of trade liberalization, trade expansion uh, within the context of open regionalism in the Western Pacific region uh, uh, during that historic period was of great importance uh, to Australia. There was some small gain uh, uh, in uh, Australian trade liberalization from the arrangements with New Zealand, which uh, uh, took which entered a new phase uh, in 1983 uh, with the uh, new steps uh, towards closer economic relations between Australia and New Zealand. Um, uh, that uh, uh, would count a bit on a uh, 
uh, a seismic meter uh, of, uh, uh, of trade policy within Australia. The most important positive effect was undoubtedly uh, the movement from uh, uh, a limited free trade agreement to uh, closer economic relations between Australia and New Zealand uh, uh, through agreement in 1983. Uh, but in the whole scheme of things, uh, that was r relatively small compared with uh, the value of Australia's unilateral decisions uh, and the decisions of other Western Pacific partners. Moving forward to the 21st century, it's hard to uh, th see uh, uh, trade development or trade expansion, especially trade creation associated with any of the bilateral FTOs showing up uh, on uh, a seismic meter uh, of movements in uh, Australian uh, positive trade policy. Uh, well, everything changed uh, in the uh, end of the 1990s, uh, uh, the early uh, 21st century. Uh, first there was the Asian financial crisis which uh, caused a loss of momentum uh, in unilateral liberalization, concerted unilateral liberalization in the Western Pacific. That's natural, that's what happens uh, during a financial crisis uh, with deep recession. In the case of several of the Southeast Asian countries and uh, Korea, a decline in output that can only be described as depression. Uh, with the, the decline in output in Indonesia being comparable to that uh, in Germany in the Great Depression. Um, the question was what was going to uh, uh, happen after growth had been restored in the Western Pacific economies after the Asian financial crisis. Well, we didn't see a restoration of trade liberalization and expansion uh, along the lines of the period of open regionalism. Uh, we saw an alternative path taken, a path of preferential trade. If we go back historically, the first big step in this direction uh, was announced in November uh, uh, 2000, uh, immediately upon the election of the George W. Bush government in the United States, uh, when the Australian government announced it would seek to negotiate a free trade agreement with the United States. The negotiation of that agreement took a number of years, but, but that announcement in November 2000 was a signal uh, that Australia had changed. Now one of the reactions to uh, the announcement uh, uh, that we were seeking a free trade agreement with the United States uh, was that uh, uh, there, there may be negative repercussions in uh, our larger and potentially very much larger trading partners in the Western Pacific. And that led the government in response to say that uh, we'll seek to negotiate uh, free trade agreements in the Western Pacific as well. Well, for the countries of East Asia, uh, that was a big change. Uh, uh, apart from the ASEAN arrangements, uh, preferential trade was unimportant uh, in East Asia, Northeast and Southeast Asia, uh, until this time. And China, newly a member of the WTO, uh, had been busy uh, uh, convincing its people and the world that multilateralism was the way to go. So when we sought to persuade China to embark on negotiations on preferential trade, uh, we were asking them to make a, a big move. Well, we succeeded. Uh, if you look narrowly at uh, diplomacy uh, in terms of uh, what was sought by the Australian government and the effect, then getting China to uh, after initial reluctance to enter negotiations on a free trade agreement uh, was uh, a diplomatic success. Now, once China had broken its commitment uh, to multilateralism, uh, it was open to uh, uh, negotiations with others, and uh, 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 both ASEAN uh, and New Zealand slipped past us. In some ways they were less demanding, but also they were less threatening in agricultural trade. They were smaller agricultural economies in Australia, and so China found it easy, easier to uh, uh, do a bilateral deal with them uh, than with Australia. As a consequence, we're still seeking to negotiate a free trade agreement uh, with China, uh, and our important agricultural trade suffers very substantial discrimination against Australia 
uh, in favour of uh, New Zealand, very important for dairy products, meat, some other products. And uh, Southeast Asia, very important for oil seeds where uh, palm oil competes with, uh, uh, with our own uh, uh, canola uh, and uh, uh, where we're competitors in sugar markets. Um, so uh, we scored an own goal there. Uh, we set China on a discriminatory uh, trading path. Uh, we're still negotiating. Uh, and uh, potentially two of our most important competitors are being favoured over us uh, as a result of the initiative that we took. Now I don't pretend uh, that uh, that does not create some case for us, us taking action. The main case uh, for uh, our doing something in the Western Pacific uh, of a preferential kind has to be uh, uh, built around the fact that we uh, cannot uh, tenably discriminate forever in favour of uh, the United States against much more important trading partners in the Western Pacific. And the case for uh, pursuing with vigour a free trade agreement with uh, China depends crucially on the fact that now uh, we are uh, subject to discrimination uh, in agricultural trade uh, that uh, can only be uh, removed by um, unilateral or multilateral liberalisation uh, by China or by, our, by ourselves entering a, a free trade agreement with them. But let's be clear-headed, let's be analytic about this. Uh, the case uh, for uh, considering uh, um, preferential trade uh, uh, is a product of our own damaging earlier decisions uh, to go down that path. To conclude, I'd like to go back to the big issues uh, the systemic effects uh, with which I began. Uh, let's look at some of the domestic policy systemic effects and some of the international policy systemic effects that have been associated with the breakdown uh, of commitment to free open trade in the 21st century. At home, uh, the movement to preferential trade was, an associate, was associated with a breakdown in commitment to the open, transparent processes that had uh, supported unilateral trade liberalisation in Australia uh, in the period of reform. Uh, the old system, and it had been crucial to the changes in Australian policy, uh, had involved um, independent uh, public assessments by the Tariff Board, then in the Industries Assistance Commission, Industries Commission, Productivity Commission, of the effects of trade liberalisation. Uh, that was all made uh, independently, uh, subject to uh, public discussion. Uh, and uh, uh, while governments uh, need not take the, the advice of the Productivity Commission, the whole world knew uh, the advice and the reasons for it. Well, a different approach was adopted uh, with free trade agreements. A different agreement, a different approach had to be adopted because uh, we know what independent analysis would have said uh, about each of these uh, bilateral agreements if it had been uh, the, uh, the Productivity Commission uh, and not uh, a commercial party uh, whose, uh, uh, whose uh, conclusions uh, were subject to influence uh, had been the, uh, the source of so-called feasibility studies. I think the draft report lets uh, the work that was done, the so-called feasibility studies uh, uh, on the US-Australia Free Trade Agreement off uh, altogether too lightly. Let's go back to, uh, uh, to the history. Uh, there were two reports done by the Centre for International Economics. The first one from memory uh, was premised on uh, removal of all barriers uh, to goods and services trade in both countries and uh, generated an increase in in uh, GDP of around 0.4%. Uh, once the agreement had been negotiated, uh, the, the main sources of benefits, which were agricultural liberalisation, and especially uh, in uh, sugar, beef, and to a lesser extent dairy, uh, were entirely or partially excluded. Uh, now, the, uh, 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 the government had committed itself to uh, having uh, another study done on the actual effects of the agreement and the study was to go before uh, a Senate uh, um, committee that was to look at the treaty. Well, the work was done but the assumptions were changed uh, and uh, suddenly, although most of the sources of the benefits of the original study 
uh, had been removed by negotiations, the benefits turned out to be substantially larger. Uh, I, I know the discussion in foreign affairs when that uh, became available. There was some questioning of the conclusions, uh, but then the uh, relevant Deputy Secretary said, but it's a good bottom line, and that was made public, and uh, the, rest of, uh, the rest of Australia was advised that the actual agreement uh, was going to generate larger benefits than the original analysis had shown uh, would be associated with complete free trade, complete removal of uh, barriers on a bilateral basis. That was the beginning of what is, what can straightforwardly be described as the corruption uh, of the policy analysis and policy making process in Australia and variations on that theme have been part of uh, all of the discussions of free trade agreements since then. It's very important for the sake of the integrity of our policy making processes and for the outcomes that we get back to independent analysis, transparent analysis um, pub, uh, that can be used as a basis of public education. And I think the, uh, uh, the conclusion of the final report of the Productivity Commission gives us a chance to do that. Um, and then uh, internationally, uh, the processes were different, but the shift into uh, preferential trade uh, in the rest of the world as well as in Australia marked the end of the era uh, of unilateral trade liberalisation and also the end of the era uh, of, uh, uh, of multilateral uh, uh, um, liberalisation. Now the multilateral system may have run into trouble anyway but there's no doubt uh, that the dynamics of uh, uh, pervasive bilateral negotiations uh, weakened uh, support for uh, uh, real multilateral liberalisation. Much more important, uh, it removed the basis, the political basis for uh, continued momentum uh, in unilateral liberalisation. The idea of uh, strong gains being associated with unilateral liberalisation didn't die, it remained important in uh, academic and some high policy discussion, uh, but it ceased to be the driving force behind trade policy uh, through the, our critically important Western Pacific region. Well, where do we go to, from here? I think we have to restore the Australian political culture of the era of reform uh, and a strong analytic um, uh, rigorously argued uh, final report uh, from the Productivity Commission can play an important role in that, just as the, uh, uh, the, the, the clear, analytically strong uh, reports of the Tariff Board uh, were so important to the Australian trade policy discussion a, couple of, a few decades ago. Um, internationally, uh, one has to recognise that it's going to be a long haul. Uh, Australia's uh, influence for the good uh, on uh, uh, transparent analysis and uh, unilateral liberalisation, of course, has been greatly weakened by our own example. But we could turn that to our advantage. Uh, it was noticed earlier on that Australia's uh, far-reaching unilateral liberalisation had, be had been associated uh, with uh, a big improvement in productivity performance. Uh, the 1990s uh, put Australia at the top of the, uh, the Productivity Growth League of the OECD. That was noticed and over time became part of a, of a case uh, for uh, unilateral liberalisation in other countries. We can use the underperformance of Australia, the loss of momentum in productivity growth, uh, to argue the contrary point, that the deterioration in our product productivity culture, our political culture, uh, the return to rent-seeking behaviour, the uh, departure from independent transparent analysis uh, uh, had the effects that economists and others uh, uh, would have predicted for it uh, in, in uh, ending the era of strong Australian productivity growth. So we can turn uh, what's a very painful outcome uh, for Australia into a virtue uh, by showing the Australian case to be an example both of the 
positive benefits of a transparent process and unilateral liberalization and the negative effects of its absence. Uh, we can, once we have restored the role of the Productivity Commission uh, and restored its uh, analytic uh, uh, strength as well as uh, its uh, independent uh, capacity, uh, then uh, it will be useful for us to argue the case for similar transparency institutions in other countries. At the height of Australia's superior productivity performance uh, and at the height of uh, the role of the Productivity Commission in trade policy, the Australian example was much discussed in a number of countries in our region. I know from personal experience it was much discussed in Indonesia and in China. We can get back to that period uh, of uh, positive influence on institutional development once we are doing better ourselves. Finally, uh, what do we do about uh, uh, the niggling problem, but more than a niggling problem uh, of discrimination against us as a result of uh, other countries' uh, preferential trading areas uh, in the Asia-Pacific. Well, the first thing I would do is, uh, is to keep in mind the strong message from the draft report that most of the benefits uh, from trade liberalisation for Australia still come from our own liberalisation. So let's get back to getting rid of the rest of our protection. And alongside that, I would suggest that uh, we make an offer to any country that wants to um, enter an FTA with us or preferential trading agreement with us, uh, that we will offer to them uh, in each uh, area of trade the most favourable terms that we have offered anyone else. Now they're pretty favourable because we have very open access uh, for New Zealand. Uh, and uh, what we would require in return uh, is simply for them to offer us as much as they have offered anyone else. China offering us uh, commodity by commodity the uh, most favoured nation uh, uh, treatment uh, given to either New Zealand or ASEAN uh, would uh, remove the discrimination which uh, is a significant problem for us uh, and uh, uh, we could go forward remembering uh, that what matters most is what we do ourselves, uh, that we can have a positive influence on other countries' uh, trade liberalisation uh, through uh, uh, being an example of the benefits of open process and uh, uh, trade liberalisation, uh, and in not seeking to use bilateral agreements to do any more uh, than to remove discrimination that has already been introduced uh, by the discriminatory areas of the early 21st century.